You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information. friends welcome back to storyteller conclave i am sarah i'm rob and this is a show where we uh share our storyteller knowledge about tabletop gaming and uh try to hope everybody uh if you're if you're new to storytelling uh get your game going and if you are an old veteran like us uh, hopefully step your game up a little bit yeah or at least figure out what maybe you did wrong in that last campaign or help you with those uh you know questions that you're not sure who else to ask i guess uh, this week, uh, just in quick updates, uh, we are still working on getting our Patreon finished up as the RSS feed is still coming along, uh, although we are much soon. closer. We Very are, soon. We literally yes. just talked to management and uh, they said that is uh, like moments away effectively. Yeah. So pro- yeah. before next show, that should be settled and uh, we should be uh, mm-hmm. back to being, I guess, an independent feed versus just off of uh, Podcast Detroit, which will be wonderful. It should be great. You'll be able to find us on all the major podcast networks. Uh, yeah. Hopefully we'll be we'll – be, uh, We've got to go through a little bit of an approval process is what I understand Yes, through uh, iTunes and Google Play Music and yep. stuff like that. But, Although uh, we just heard some news that they're trying the integration with Spotify as oh, well. Okay, so great. for those of us who uh, who run Spotify during the day, we will be there as well and you can subscribe. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we'll see how that all works out. But uh, keep your keep your eyes out on uh, uh, Twitter. You can find us at st underscore conclave. Uh, you can mm-hmm. also find us on Discord uh, where uh, the, the link to the Discord is on – uh, it's it's a pinned tweet on our yes. Twitter, so you'll yes. be able to get the uh, the thing there, or uh, check our show notes at podcastdetroit dot com slash show slash storyteller dash conclave. Yes, uh, I know that's that's a bit of a mouthful, but you can find us on uh, podcastdetroit dot com. Yes, um, and uh, in our show notes for any of our shows, you'll be able to find our Twitter and our Discord there. Uh, so you'll be able to, and you'll also be able to subscribe to the podcast on yeah. there as well because yeah. our RS feed will go up there as well. So uh, we also have one other thing. We have a. Strong language disclaimer on this one. As uh, <laughs> as we were going through the show notes, we realized that we were dropping some interesting verbiage. We had opinions, yeah, and uh, about uh, about the topic, and so we just wanted to make sure to some maybe of our listeners who might have younger listeners or people who might be uh, concerned about where the language are, there there might be some words dropped. We will do our this, best to this may be a PG thirteen episode. Exactly, yeah. we will do our best to make it more like. Uh, let's see. What is it like? The TBS, like mm-hmm. uh, morning to f- Monday to Friday, snakes on a plane kind of moments. Yeah, we'll, we'll try yeah, and do yeah, stuff yeah. like that when we can catch ourselves. So, uh, but our topic today, we are talking about villainy and villains and antagonists and big bad evil guys. That's BBEGs. right. That's right. That's right. Uh, so. To start off real simple, there's a lot of terms that get thrown around and we kind of want to dissect those just a little bit just to take a moment at it and talk about how we feel about those. Now, I know when we were having our original discussions about Mm -hmm. this and we talked about the name antagonist, the first thing that came to my mind is someone who is directly against or working to grind or stop the heroes in some way. Right. But it doesn't make any judgment calls about their moral – compass or about no, their overall goals. Um, an antagonist is just someone who stands in the hero's way. I mean they could be a cop exactly. like, who's just doing his job. Exactly. Um, the, the, the antagonist that comes to mind for me, like when, when I think of your, your typical antagonist mm-hmm. is uh, Javert from Les Miserables. You know, I was actually going to watch that and I totally forgot to do that this week because oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I I wanted to see the new May, Les Mis and I say new, it's it's years old. But I, I, have, a, I have a lot of opinions about the, the character of Javert, whether you classify him as a villain or not. Um, yeah. I, I like to think that he's just a, a very hardworking cop doing his job. Um, he, he goes to some extremes. He oh, yeah. becomes a real pain in the ass. To the main character, but yeah. I don't think he ever strays into villain territory. Well, I'm going to challenge you later on that topic as we get farther into this. Uh, okay. So we'll, we'll see that's, there. So that's a discussion for later right So there. let's talk about villainy then. When So when we think of villains, I think a lot of times our minds go to the twisty mustache <laughs> kind of thing, mm-hmm. you know, where you see these – these characters or, or caricatures out there of villainy with the black hats and the black outfits or the big bosses rubbing cats kind of thing who just do evil. And I think that's a misnomer. 
I think there's a lot more depth that needs to be brought into that. Of course, it's a misnomer. Rubbing cats, there's nothing wrong with that. They <laughs> no, deserve no. to be rubbed, Rob. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, They're soft and fuzzy. And Mr. Bigglesworth had a problem, but you know, <laughs> we don't judge because you know, I actually like Sphinx cats. So. Right, right, right. But uh, villains have a lot more depth to them and we're going to get into that depth today. But one of the other terms that we, we keep coming back to and I know you said you heard a mm-hmm. lot is antihero. Is antihero. And I, I think a lot of people misuse the term. Um, when you look up the term antihero, it basically describes someone who is who acts as the hero of a story but lacks your typical heroic characteristics. Yeah. Um, in the uh, reading that definition, the, the first person I think in, in pop culture, everyone here is going to be able to recognize. If you're geek enough to be listening to this podcast, yeah. you're geek enough to have seen Deadpool. Yes, or at least tangentially know who he is. Right. And Deadpool is the first person that came to mind when I when I read the definition of antihero. Yeah. So if you if you are talking about villainous archetypes or people who would stand in the way of the heroes, antihero is actually one we wanted to throw out there just so we could exclude them from the discussion. Yeah, we don't want to confuse <clears throat> them with antagonists or villains. These are literally just not really heroic. Right. Te- heroes. Technically, antiheroes are good guys. Technically. They they may take the long way around and they yeah. may use some real underhanded techniques. Right. They'll probably be very crass. They'll probably be pretty violent. They'll buck the system a lot, but they're heroes. And to the heroes, they may actually be antagonists in mm-hmm. some cases. I mean, look at characters like Punisher. He literally ignores the law at times. To get to what he wants to do. Yeah, his his main trade is murder. So I, th- right. I think that pretty much puts him against the law. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I I I'm gonna kind of set the mm-hmm. the obvious tone there, but right. there are times when he looks at heroes, people mm-hmm. who are legitimately trying to do it, not necessarily by the book, but at least by the moral compass, mm-hmm. and it's just like you're doing it wrong, and puts two caps in the guy and walks away. Yeah. Like, you know, I solved the problem. Yep. You were literally going to let that problem continue. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a good way of looking <clears throat> at it. So that being said, now that we're starting to get to the closer to what a villain is versus just an antagonist, there's a lot of flavor that blends into that. Sure, 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 sure. Um, villains come come really in, in in all sizes and shapes. I mean, you you can uh, there, there's there's you know just your typical villains that that hate the PCs. And want to directly oppose them. You know, it may be just like a, a noble that they slighted along the way. May not have any grander designs than just, hey, I hate the PCs. F those guys. Right. And when we were talking, one of the things that came to my mind, and I think we we kind of went back and forth on this on the antagonist versus villain, mm-hmm. is that I kind of see a villain as someone who, regardless of if the PCs are there, they have an agenda. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, a lot of it, I will caveat, like I said before, uh, with to you was that. There are always the villains that get created by the PCs or get created by the heroes. A good example is The Incredibles, the very first movie. Syndrome, yeah. Yeah, he was a hero-created villain Mm -hmm. without question. Absolutely. But I think if you just set that one classification aside, sure, you know, at least that one. There's probably the others. A villain is going to be a villain whether the PCs are there or not. Exactly. They have an agenda. There's things going on. Mm -hmm. They're going to keep doing what they're doing. Sure. Sure. Um, and we'll, we're going to even get to that. But I think we've got some other areas that we kind of talked about, like, is a plague a villain? Can it be a villain? Right. You know, something like in a zombie apocalypse, is that a villain? You know, I think to a degree it is. I think that it has the characteristics that we're going to break down. Mm-hmm. But I think it's hard to think about that as a villain itself as an as a, a a rough entity if you will right right it's uh i think what it really comes down to is uh your basic story uh, story building um uh attribute of theme right you know ma- man versus wild man versus uh environment man versus whatever right man versus man um and so it's really kind of you know that the versus part is right. typically where your villain sits and so if it's man versus plague if it's man versus zombie apocalypse yeah is it man versus evil empire yeah um, i mean in the case it's a of like distinction you know right and i think one of the things that kind of triggered me on the uh, on the idea of the plague and the the zombie apocalypse is some of those things are get created by accident mm-hmm. there's no like I'm opening these portals and I'm really the villain because I'm allowing this to happen. It can be as simple as like a contagion that mm-hmm. just screwed up. Yeah. You know, that somebody – there was no malice. There was nothing that did it wrong. But then you can always 
add to that flavor if you wanted to and do things like where it's a cover-up. Like in the case of uh, Firefly for all those people out there is that really the villain kind of in the end there was two parts. It was the state or the government trying to cover up what they had done because mm-hmm. if they had let anybody – if they had let the truth out – and told people, hey, here's the problem. Here's how to solve it. People are going to go, how do you know so well how to solve this problem? Right, right. You know, but it's also the Reavers because right. they're Reavers. Exactly. Um, you know, and I, I think there's there's two things that that kind of distinctly make your uh, it, it kind of draw the line between a setting, like a mm-hmm. campaign setting. Like you can have a campaign setting during the zombie apocalypse, and zombies oh, yeah. are just. A thing. Right. They're an environmental factor. They're not right. necessarily a villain. Just because they're they're a, a complicating factor in your PC's lives does not make them a villain necessarily. But I think there's two factors that really do that for you. Um, the first is can you resolve that that issue? Can right. you resolve that villain? Or, right. or antagonist, you know. Right. Is there anything you can do about it? Like, can you ever solve the zombie apocalypse? If if so, then it may. It, it, yeah. if, if you can directly oppose it and possibly overcome it, right. you know, if you find a, perhaps it's a quest for a cure, right, or something like Close that, closing the portal or something, right, right, right. Um, like uh, one thing that that kind of uh, when we were discussing this earlier, uh, uh, the fourth Elder Scrolls game, Oblivion, yes, um, where your your villain kind of is a Daedric invasion. There are portals opening all over the place and there are these awful creatures from Oblivion spilling in and invading Tamriel all over right, the place. Right. And your goal is to directly oppose that and to resolve that. And you're not going to beat the big bad guy who's behind it because the big bad guy is a is, is a is a Daedric prince. It's a god effectively. He's, he's essentially a god yeah. in, in in that uh, in that setting. And so you're you know you're you're not going to be able to do that, but you can resolve the portals. Right. You can stop the invasion. Right. So I think that makes an effective environmental villain. You yes. Know? Whereas, like, I I would <clears throat> I would counter that with something like Shadowrun, mm-hmm. where a lot of people see the the individual missions that come out of it to be like the the setting, but you also have the megacorps. Yep. Which are the man that you're opposing. Now, a lot of people can say, well, you can take down a megacorp, but that's where we start talking to that campaign region of villainy where it's like, is that your story? Is it the thing that you're trying to take down mm-hmm. or is it just part of the setting Yep. and your villain is something else? And I think we've got a much larger campaign discussion that we can have with that and I think we can frame that. But for now, maybe we bring it back down to just – Sure. An individual, a face, if you will. Exactly. And that's that's the second factor is if you do have something broad and so much bigger than your PCs, it helps to bring it down and give that overwhelming force some sort of a face. Right. Uh, so the, the two the two things that, that came to mind for me um, from – uh, classic cinema here is uh, Immortan Joe yep. from Mad Max. Yep, I think that's a perfect. Um, I mean, you had all the War Boys and right. that whole thing, and even the Wasteland itself was kind of its own, you know, right. complicating factor. But the the one person who kind of uh, uh, exemplified all of that, the right. one part, the one person who was the concentrated thing that you needed to defeat mm-hmm. to beat the Wasteland was Immortan Joe. Right. Um, the second one is actually from uh, Star Trek, uh, the Borg Queen. Yeah. No, I know that was a controversial move when right. it first came out. Oh, like, totally. Well, hold on. You've got a collective, but now you've got a queen. Yeah. Like, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, like, like it or hate it. Right. That's why that cinematic um, writing decision was made was because how do you have a compelling story of just fighting waves of mindless drones? Right. You give them a face. You give the viewer, you give the audience, and you give the PCs someone to look at and say, you are the source of this problem. Right. So now instead of feeling overwhelmed by thousands of Borg, we're like, if we can just beat the queen, now suddenly this becomes achievable. Right. And you don't – it's a it's a lot easier to apply your feelings, your emotions, your um your actions and your right. plans to a person than it is to an entire army. Right. Right. And I, I think that's it. So <clears throat> so using that as, I don't know, a gateway, let's talk a little bit about villainy, but I want to take it at a different angle. Okay. I want to start by saying how not to create a villain. Okay. Come and pulse. I, one of the things that uh one of the questions that came up and I think it was a beautiful question was 
do you get hampered by calling them a villain when you're creating them? Oh, God, yeah. That and was I a... thought that it, – it struck me. I just stared at the question and I'm like, do I do that? That question uh, came in on our on our Discord thanks to Knox in a Box, friend yeah. of the show. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, just – I mean you uh, – whether you know it or not, because um, I know we just kind of gave it a thumbs up on the Discord, but I do want to say that you spawned a long discussion yeah. in person <laughs> yeah. Yeah. as we were going over our show notes for this. So no, good, no. Good job hitting us it was in the solid. Fields. So So I would say to do a quick answer to that was – no, I don't think you do yourself a disservice because I think you're preparing yourself for it, but I don't think you're talking about the person yet. And this is where we start talking about what makes a villain and what it doesn't make. And I think the first thing I have to say for people who are starting out new, who might be making a new campaign or mm-hmm. doing something simple, don't just have evil for the sake of evil. Like that doesn't help you at all when you're trying to have the PCs have an interaction with it. Mm-hmm. Just to be a guy who's crazy. Even a crazy guy has some reason behind it. Right. And the, 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 probably the, the, your most famous trope is I want to destroy the world What and, that, and then what? That's where I keep all my stuff. Why, Why would you want to do that? That's where you keep all of exactly. your stuff too. Exactly. Like, you're essentially committing suicide and you're taking all of us with you. Right. And, you know, what, what's, what's up, buddy? <laughs> right, right. I mean there's always a reason behind it. Is it a world eater? Like is it just the materials? Are you destroying the Earth because I don't know? You have to put an intergalactic bypass through. You know, I mean, I, I made a I made a deal with an eldritch god, and if I feed them the world, I go. will become their herald in the coming apocalypse or something. I mean, that's that's cool. That's yeah. a good reason to destroy the world. Exactly. So have a base reason for what they're doing and why they're doing that to give them a bit more tangibility mm-hmm. to have you accept it. Um, a uh, Within that reason, you also have to look at what lines they will cross. And I think that's really where you start creating villainy because when we're talking about heroes, we're talking about people who are doing things for a reason as well, Mm -hmm. that they have drive, but they also have some hard lines that they won't cross. But as they slowly broach through those, they develop. And this is somebody who you know has those lines as well and has crossed some of them already. Right. We, uh, we talk a lot about the hero's journey. Right. Uh, and what, what takes a common person and turns them into the hero that they are. But it's, it's easy to, to forget that there's also a villain's journey. Right. And it's a slow descent into villainy. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I would say if you're going to be building a villain, probably your best place to do is start off with an ordinary person and then just ask, what broke them? Yeah. What pushed them over a line? And then what pushed them over the next line? When was the first person they killed? You know, what was what was the the the, the thing that made them decide that it is worth it to do this horrible act? You know, in in uh what what was the math basically behind right. it? Like what – why was it more worth it for them to do something horrible than it was to not do it? Yeah, let's take in, – and in, I often go to movies because mm-hmm. a lot of movies have very good villains but you have to be careful. But one of the ones that we came back and forth with and we dissected pretty quickly was Killmonger. Mm-hmm. Um, that Black Panther's villain, everyone kind of agreed by the end of the movie that they understood him. They understood what he was doing and yet it was clearly – Understandably, he was a villain, but even he had lines. He loved his people, mm-hmm. and arguably more than the original king of Wakanda because they had forgotten about everybody who wasn't in Wakanda. Which is kind of his beef. You know, you know I mean, and I understand that. And so that's the thing is that if you can come to terms with who this person is and why they're doing what they're doing, it makes it that much more tangible for your players and easier for you as you're going through the story to de- make those delineations of where they're going to go and when they're going to break further because there's always going to be more lines. Oh, there's always going to be more lines. Um, but on top of moving across lines, right. there's always there's always like the, the question you should always ask yourself is can that person move back? From those lines, mm-hmm. is there a redemption arc for this uh, for this uh, this villain? Before we get into redemption, let's let's talk a little bit more about the villains themselves. Okay, sure. I sure, mean, we've sure. got the flavors of villains. You know, yeah, you're, yeah. You're typical. Everybody said murder, death, kill. There's always one right. murderous villain who basically just doesn't consider murder murder to be a problem. Right, right. To arguably, Punisher, kind of a villain in a sense, but he's he's got a direction that doesn't put him that way. It's just mm-hmm. part of it. But you have your villains who really just don't consider murder to be a big deal. Uh, Joker. Yeah. Like. 
doesn't consider it to be a big deal. But there are definitely villains who won't kill certain individuals. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got your your mob bosses, your controllers, the ones who don't actually sully their hands with the with, with the morality of of having to kill this individual directly. They they want a problem taken care of, and Tony goes and takes care of the problem. Right. You know. Right. Right. But they're still villains. <clears throat> Uh, those would also be like your media moguls, your corporate entities, oh, you yeah. know, your your people who, who view themselves actually as above such things, right? And they they hold themselves to a higher standard. They would never dirty their hands like that. Right. That's why they hire Tony. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> but you have just as much the 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 CIA assassin type who goes mm -hmm. and just takes care of problems, but his agenda in his head is. I'm solving problems. Right. It's just it's just numbers to them. That's right. One That's less right. person, one less problem. You know. You know, and in to a degree, they're righteous. They fully have committed to whatever that drive is, mm -hmm. and they don't care really who's at the helm because they're getting what they need out of it. You know, in that yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, and then we talked about uh, uh, the the more cult of personality types. You know, where they've got they actually aren't quote unquote a villain. They just have a drive, but what they promote is a little less than, shall we say, moral full. Sure. They they may they may by their ethos and and by encouraging their followers incite violence. Not necessarily like, hey Tony, I need this problem taken care of, direct order, but right. more like a uh, you know, cults of personality where where their their followers may go out and do horrendous acts in their name, like and, a cult leader. Yeah, like a cult leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, these are these all make really great villain archetypes. Exactly, exactly. And we could go through dozens of these. And there's obviously the TV tropes that you can go through. You know, where literally there's every tropey boss that you mm -hmm. can think of out there. Mm -hmm. So don't just limit yourself to to trying to think of a trope. Start with who the person is. Start with what the situation is. I mean I go to the most recent ver movie version of Dread. The villain in that was understandable. She was broken. Mm -hmm. she, she was broken by the environment and the environment created what she needed, which was a drug, and she lived off of that drug and eventually became the leader of said drug lord of that area. Mm -hmm. So that even she knew that there was bigger, badder fish out there, but this was her block to to stand on and it was the only thing that was keeping her – I don't know. I can't even say semi-sane, but keeping her attached to this world. Sure, sure, sure. So she was she was crazy and she was definitely evil without question or remorse. But at the same time, she was also understandably why she was there. You you, you could attach to it. It made sense. Yeah. Not not all villains need to be sympathetic, but frankly, I find it helps. I I, I find it, it it helps a lot that you have. Um, the ability to to at least connect with your villain, uh, because honestly, if if you've got no connection with your villain, like if you've got no way of of uh, having that 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 bit of humanity where you kind of go, oh god, I kind of see his point, you know, um, then it becomes very easy to just to write them off. It becomes very easy to write them off, and then your your conflict with them means nothing. Because you're like, oh, you're you're just an asshole. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but if 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 they're not just an asshole, if you can if you can look that person in the eye and go, okay, Eric Killmonger, like, I, uh, you know, you are an asshole, but I kind of get it. Like, yeah. Now suddenly I'm conflicted. Like, do I want to take you down, or do I want to like? try to rehabilitate you or do I want to try to – I don't know. Like right, how right. do I handle it when I can see your point, you know? And then you come to what you were kind of bringing about, which mm -hmm. was at the end of that, he did understand him. Like our hero did understand him and did want to give him, quote unquote, a good death. Yeah. A, rede a redeeming moment where he was like, I will try and do better. I mean he even went back you know, to the magical plane of his father mm -hmm. and basically looked at him and said, you lied to me or didn't tell me the entire truth and I'm not going to be you. <clears throat> like I'm not going to cover this up. This was a shitty thing to do. We need to move forward from this right. onto something else. So that actually that, – that's a, that's a good segue here. So like resolving villains. Okay. Yeah. You know earlier I mentioned that a, a villain is – you know – it's really in uh, only a villain if you can, you know, if you can directly confront them, if you can directly resolve them. Exactly, exactly. So, how do you have that resolution with your villain? Right. I mean, do we? 
Uh, do you have like a big showdown where basically it's a super fight and you're 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 just gonna wipe them off the face of the planet? That's definitely your classic, right? You know, right. Your classic thing. Like I think most movies have that where you set your villain up and then you have the climax of your story where the mm-hmm. heroes and the villains all meet and directly fight each other. Right. Right. The villains are either defeated or subdued or killed or yeah. apprehended. Your, your tombstone moment. Your your you know you're shining in the street where everybody's looking at each other, hands on their hips, waiting for the showdown. You know. Right. You know, and then you have your redemption arc, which are more challenging by far, mm-hmm. but definitely give you that same kind of closure where they're the the, the villain takes care of themselves in the end. You know, where <laughs> basically they commit seppuku, you know, and end themselves and pull themselves out of the equation, or they look at you and say, "Shit, I've done something wrong." Like, I'm sorry, the end of the Lego Movie. Was a perfect example of a villain that comes into a redemption arc. Because I'm a bad geek, I haven't seen the Lego. Oh, movie. you need to see the Lego movie just horrible. for just for character sake. I'm literally the and worst. And I will ruin the ending for you. The main spoiler alert, villain spoiler alert is totally for anybody else out there like me. Really? So, <laughs> but literally at the end, the hero goes to the villain and says, "You're just as you know, I, you know, I'm supposed to be the one, you know, like the Neo, the one kind of thing, but you could be the one." And it changes his whole mind from like, "Wait a second, I." I can do cool things too. Sure. Why not? Mm-hmm. We can all be awesome and creative and playful. And it was like, oh, shit. So I've screwed up this entire time. And it's it's a neat story. I highly recommend it. I, mm-hmm. I, I'm not ruining anything more than that for you. But I think that kind of redemption arc where you've – where the hero has made a journey that eventually meets – the villain and the villain hasn't met them all the way and then finally the hero brings them to that same conclusion. My favorite redemption arc is Zuko from oh, uh, Avatar. Yeah. Uh, he, for for two solid seasons, he is the biggest douchebag. Totally. And uh, so driven by just his his hatred and his his father mm-hmm. and his his – depiction of honor and stuff like that and then just watching him say oh my god i've just realized that i'm i'm that guy yeah and come crawling to the avatar and, and it just it was it was phenomenal it was so well written and like for any storytellers out there who want to see how to do a redemption arc that's my suggestion but it also opens the next thing which is the power vacuum uh-huh you know where you have one of your villain falls, oh, and God, another that one a, picks right back up. Great segue, yes. Like seriously, we had the second. Like, oh look, power vacuum. I'm going to step up, and I'm the crazy one. Yep. Oh, well, someone isn't doing this job now because you decided you wanted to have your little redemption arc and go join the Avatar. So someone has to be the this asshole, and it might as well be Azula. Exactly. I mean, you've yep. got the same thing happening in, uh, like you you can see it in like Knights of the Old Republic, uh-huh. where you have. These amazing Sith masterminds who are getting killed by their underlings at the moment when they need to go away because they're no longer good at their job. Mm-hmm. Like, and I'm you're, you're thank you for building all this up and making me really powerful. And yank, now you're uh, now I'm going to pull this out from underneath you and kill you. And no, I'm going to step forward. Yep. And it's not like that other person wasn't expecting that moment. Yeah. The, the 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 big thing to remember about uh, about power vacuums when you're when you're writing these sort of arcs is mm-hmm. that just because you've taken a villain out of the equation does not mean you've taken the villain's infrastructure out of exactly. the equation. It doesn't mean you've taken all of his henchmen out of the equation. Yeah. Because what a villain does is they sit there at the top of their little power pyramid and they do all this bad stuff and they've got all these people under them. They've got their henchmen. They've got their lieutenants. Mm-hmm. And all those people are looking up at the villain saying, that guy's powerful. That guy's going someplace and he's got all this cool stuff to do that and I believe in his mission. Mm -hmm. So if you take him out without disassembling that power structure, someone is bound to step up and say, I can do this job. Yep. I can do that. Yep. Or you run the other risk, which is, okay, the vacuum's there. You keep what you kill. Mm-hmm. And then you end up having the PCs fill the vow- the the slot, and now the question is, what do you do? Ooh, yeah. PCs become the villains. That's right. That sounds That's like right. a future podcast. Exactly. To me. Yeah, we're gonna get to that one day. But finally, <clears throat> the villain that that I kind of <laughs> don't like and you love. Oh, I love I love this sword. Now I'm gonna say this with a caveat. Okay, this word we're, we're about to go. We're about to segue into the last of our villain types, and that is the slippery villain, the yes. one that gets away. Constantly. Um, so I love this type of villain because it creates a recurring villain. 
and it allows you to build up an emotional response. And I think a villain without a powerful emotional response is an ineffective villain in a story. I think that's I fair. Think you have to – it was it's it's the the very reason, if I may tangent slightly, it is the reason I love Deep Space Nine most out of all of the Star Treks because they took the time to sit still in a point in space long enough to build up characters, to build up politics, to build mm-hmm. up story arcs with the same people constantly, Gul Dukat, Kai Wynn, over – over seasons mm-hmm. and so when it came to season six season seven and gold ducat was up to doing whatever gold ducat does <laughs> true now suddenly you're like oh that asshole i hate him so much he keeps doing you know instead yeah. of just who's this random cardassian who's being a jerk bag exactly you know exactly and at this i mean and you've got your other antagonists and such who are involved in that where you've got the you know, uh, you've got your characters who you're not sure if they're a villain or not sure if they're a hero. They're definitely running that gray edge. Mm-hmm. The, you know, the tailor who sat there and ran that thin line, but there was a redemption there. There was definitely a move to a heroicness, but even he had an understanding. You mm-hmm. knew what his motives were. You knew where he was going to go and the choices he was going to make. And as those moments got closer and closer to him getting to his his point of mm-hmm. of of drive, you got intense excitement about like, okay, is this person going to do this or not? Yeah, and that's the kind of feeling you want out of villains or yeah. even henchmen or anything like that. Rob is having a slight chair yeah, malfunction. My chair right just now? literally dropped me. Your chair just sank and, like six yeah, inches. And, and are you are you okay? Kate's going to die over here in the corner. She's. <laughs> I think she's literally going to die. K- Kate's like, we talked about this. <laughs> we did. We did. We did. I think I did that on purpose. It's funny because before the show started, I said I was probably going to have to do that yeah. every like ten minutes, but here you yep. are. Yep. 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 He's just beating me. you to the totally. punch. Just beating you to the punch. <laughs> so. So yeah, so if we're talking about – we've talked about our villains from our point of view, but we had some really good questions come in. So uh, I, I guess I'm going to throw it to you is do we want to go through these and punch them out or do we want to toss them back and forth? Well, hold on one, one second because I, I had one more thought about the slippery oh, villain. sure. One more thought and, and, and that is that I don't like doing the slippery villain on the big bad evil guy. I okay. don't think the big bad evil guy should be your slippery villain. Fair enough. Okay, because that becomes a frustrating experience. Because your big bad evil guys are going to get all of your attention. They're going right. to get all of your ire. Right. They're going to get the extent of multiple game sessions worth of planning right. on how to deal with them, right. how to take them down. You're going to be carefully dismantling their power structures and getting collecting artifacts or whatever it is you're doing in your game to try right. to thwart your big bad evil guy. Sure. Okay. And if at the end of that they're like, oh nope, zoop. And I escape. Yeah. With in, unless there was a critical failure in your PC's plan mm-hmm. that you just have to exploit for story reasons, then really I, I don't I don't feel like that should be a move. I I really think if you're going to do the slippery villain, the one that constantly gets away, it should be a minor thorn in the side of the party. Okay. The, the henchman, if you will. A henchman or a, a side character. Really, where, where the slippery villain comes in, I think, the best is when your PCs hand you a backstory mm-hmm. and it's got, oh, this this asshole was my arch rival growing up or yep. this is, you know, that this is the person who, who uh, you know, uh, was responsible for destroying my father's business. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because he uh, he had some slight with our family back in the day or something mm-hmm. like that. And that's what put me on the street and got me into adventuring. Yeah. You know, or something like that. That is the perfect guy yeah. to make your slippery villain because they can be enough of a thorn in the side. And when they escape, it's not like a huge – it doesn't stop the campaign. It doesn't derail right. the campaign. Right. You just kind of go, son of a bitch, I'll get him next time. And then you go focus on your main problem again until he pops back in four game sessions later mm-hmm. doing some other dickbaggery. Yep. And – now all of a sudden you've got another like oh I want to I want to thwart him and then yep. he gets away. Yep. You know. Yeah. We warned you about these content. We warned you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the slippery villain is always the one who throws out those we, words. Oh, we have opinions. <laughs> we do. We do. 
Okay. Okay. All right. So let's get questions, to these good questions from Discord. Thank you again, Discord members and listeners. We appreciate your questions. They open up so much discussion that we don't get a chance because there are times when we look at those questions on Discord and I want to answer them, but then I realize we got to do it in the show. And then some, <laughs> sometimes we do anyway. We do it anyway. So. But but I think I I did put those even even if we did discuss your question on Discord, mm-hmm. I still put those questions yes. in here because I still want to have that conversation on the air, mm-hmm. just in case you're not going to our Discord, which you should. Everybody should. Um, yeah, but. go back, look at them, enjoy. All right, so let's let's kick one of these out. All right. So Technolich, once again, sent us in a, a couple of great questions here. So uh, the first question he had for us is, what are your thoughts on recurring villains from mastermind types to the unkillable weasel or anything in between? Are those – are these something you use in your games and to what effect? So I think we, we've we touched we, on a lot of this stuff already. Yeah, I definitely think we do. Um I but, like reoccurring villains. I think that in certain campaigns, they're important. I think if your campaign is very episodic, let's say like really it's an adventuring crew who's mm-hmm. working for – let's 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 paint a little picture here. They're working for someone rich, wealthy, Landover, whatever, yeah. and they're cleaning up things. They're building up their reputation, if you will. Mm-hmm. And then you've got someone who maybe is a rival who should be doing those jobs but isn't and that person is a constant thorn in their side and basically being going from antagonist – to villain. Mm-hmm. I think that's a perfect way of doing it. And the unkillable, I think, is tropey, but I think it is important that there's an important place for that. When you have a villain who is a masterful, unbelievable, top end villain that the players will eventually move to, mm-hmm. it is an unkillable. But it it will be at some point. It will be endable at some point. Well, I think when he says unkillable weasel, I think he's more talking about the slippery villain. I agree, but I was um, I, I want to make sure that we have a distinction. But, but sure, sure, yeah. sure, sure. I mean, you do have some of those unkillable, like monolithic bad guys yeah. that are like you know Galactus. Yeah, or or I mean, even to a degree, you, know. you, you have someone who's like you know uh, Moriarty. Who's yeah. just so slick at what he's doing. He's such a mastermind that you'll never be able to outwit him. Mm-hmm. So you have to do something witless right. to try and right. even catch him off guard. Uh, I think I think for recurring villains, um, I think it really depends on what type of campaign you're running. Yeah. Uh, I think in a large campaign that you're, you're running like – like uh, my, my tabletop game right now is more of a global arc. Yeah. Um. It's a it's a big long. We're always heading down kind of the same storyline. It isn't terribly episodic. It's had some episodic things to it, but they've all been kind mm-hmm. of leading up to the same same big, you know, meta plot. Yeah. Um. I think recurring villains are a lot easier to do when you're doing an episodic. Way way easier. Way easier because because you have chance to recur reoccur. Mm-hmm. Uh. Like in mine, the Poppy King is the is the big bad evil guy right, right. now, and that's like every single game so far has been just inching closer towards the confrontation with him. Right. Whereas something like Seventh C, if you're on the ocean, mm-hmm. I may constantly throw Race at you, who is the 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 Captain Hook, mm-hmm. who's just out there kicking ass. That's what he does. Oh, who's so. who's that guy? My character was hunted by. Uh, well, actually, he's an unknown person, but we'll go there. <laughs> <laughs> so it was. I had a I had a villain that was uh, that was hunting after uh, Sarah's character because of a well, let's just say a murder that she did. <laughs> Buddy, they were trying to invade our ship. I put a bullet in his head. That's you solved the, the problem. I solved the problem. You punished your way through the problem. Yes, I did. All right. So I think we kind of got through that question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this next question is really good, and this comes from ShibiGB, and I. I, I am not going to put a pin in this one as, as hard as we should, but we're going to – we are definitely going to say we're going to talk about this and that is what are your thoughts on potential trigger scenarios? Do you speak about it with players ahead of time? I am going to flat out say yes. I, yes. I think that any time yes. that you have – because you should know your players before you step anywhere near those. I mean I would never open a campaign with a – with an event or a trigger scenario or something like that. Uh, there are definitely ways to – to paint those pictures without it being a trigger. But we are going to have a discussion about this in the future. This is definitely going to be a topic. This is something Sarah and I have talked about multiple times. Yeah, this this is so, this is honestly its own show. Yeah. Um, but we we can definitely address the the, the problem here. Um or the the not the problem, the, the question here. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um I think there's there's two kind of answers to this. Okay. One is a uh a proactive and one is a reactive. Yes. Because 
yeah, you should definitely discuss things that you know are sensitive topics. Yep. Um, like uh, like I had mentioned um, earlier, there's a there's a potentiality mm-hmm. that uh, children being in a combat situation yep. will be a minor plot point. Right. And uh, as my PCs were getting closer to that becoming a plot point, uh, I I stopped game and I said, you know, I, I just remembered that this is a thing. I do want to make sure that this is OK with everybody mm-hmm. uh, because it could potentially lead to dead kids. If 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 things happen, it's not it's not an absolute yep. you know thing that's going to happen. But if this plot resolves in a certain way, it could result in dead children. Right, and that is not okay by some people's standards. Yep. And we're all here to have fun. Mm-hmm. We're all here to contribute to one another's enjoyment. And yep. I do not want to traumatize anybody yeah. by telling a story about dead children. So it, so in that, I would agree that. Just like any good storyteller on TV Mm -hmm. or in movies, you prepare them. Yep. Always prepare. Viewer discretion is advised. This may contain sensitive content. But at the same time, be prepared for them to say, I'm not up for that sensitive content. Yep. And as a storyteller, if you acknowledge that there is said st- uh, sensitive content, be prepared to write around it. Yeah. Because the moment, and, and, and I am, like, the, it's, it's not an absolute must that there are children in this particular scenario mm-hmm. that, that, that may unfold. Yep. Um, and I'm keeping this intentionally vague because, uh. I'm still playing this game. <laughs> Rob is one of my players and a handful of my other players are probably listening right now. Probably. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a must. Um, it's it's something I, I I I put into the story because I feel it would enhance it within a certain to in a certain mm-hmm. way. Um, it would make my villain more horrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in a, in a certain respect, obviously putting kids into a situation like that. But if one of my if even one of my players raised their hand and said, "I'm not so sure about that," yeah, that's that's it. Yep. Uh, they're 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 adults now. They're eighteen. Yep. yep. They're they're young, but they're eighteen. Yep. Yep. And I you think, know. you know, I, I think any scenario can can evolve. I think players may think they're OK with something mm-hmm. and as they get deeper into it, they may not be OK with it. Yeah. You, you do need to be prepared as a storyteller to adjust. And that's and that's the reactive half of my answer is yep. sometimes you don't know that things are going to be triggering. Yep. And so if, you know, a player pulls you aside and says, hey, you know, uh, this this scene kind of really made me feel bad. Yeah. Be prepared to sit down with your with your uh, your table and say, yeah, OK, um, we talked. This is making this player uncomfortable. So we're not going to go in that direction anymore. And the events I'm, – I'm retconning them right now. The events unfolded in this way rather than that way and we're proceeding with that as canon. Right. Further right. – we can, we can talk about it as adults further. But I also think it's important to put your foot down and just say there's, there's not going to be discussion. This is not negotiable. One of our players is uncomfortable. This is not negotiable. Right. It's no longer a factor in our story. All right. I think that was good. I yep. think we didn't get too far. But be aware that there will be other discussions on this. There will – I believe we're going to do a full show on, yeah. on yep. – that encompasses this topic as well. So all right. Uh, I think the next question is to you. OK. Uh, so this is once again from Technolich uh, who asks, what are our thoughts on the bad guys turned good guys and vice versa? Uh, I think it's fantastic. I think the journey is is the best part of things. Having knowing what their drive is, especially as henchmen or even villains as they switch, is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I love seeing people who are antagonists get switched. I think that's a great way to go, and I think that's t- something totally doable in stories. Yep, yep. Uh, I I really like a couple of very particular st- uh, scenarios. Mm-hmm. Um, first off, uh, I. I think this is something you and I touched upon uh, in our in our pre-show discussion mm-hmm. is that uh, oftentimes the heroes already are kind of villains. Um, Wait, there's, a, there's, so. a, there's a term we like to throw around, murder hobos. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think murder or hobo is like really no. anything you want to be no. at any given time. So yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I think at the point in which you're just basically killing and robbing, uh, you're, you need to acknowledge that maybe there's something wrong about how you're going about things. But, you know, hey, all campaigns are different. Whatever. Maybe not. You're never uh, the villain of your own story. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I like to see heroes in that situation where the rug kind of gets pulled out from under them and they go through a series of machinations believing they're doing the right thing. And then all of a sudden they realize that they're the ones holding the smoking gun at the end of the day and going, oh, God, we are – Oh, everything made sense up until this point, but yep. oh my god! Um, yeah, there's something to be said about putting heroes 
in what they believe to be heroic situations only to discover that they're the villains mm -hmm. of the story and that they're the ones that the world's trying to stop and figuring out what to do at that point. My, I love those. My, my other favorite trope mm. has definitely got to be when you introduce it, when you have a villain mm -hmm. and you, typically a principled villain of some sort. Sure. Uh, a lawful evil. Sure. Um, and then you introduce a bigger, badder evil, mm -hmm. and that villain turns around and says, "All right, listen, goddammit. it, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a bad guy, but I've got lines right, that right. I won't cross, yeah, yeah. and I will not stand for that." Well, it was uh, it was uh, Joker who said, "Even I don't steal from the IRS." Right. <laughs> Like, yeah. like yeah. pay them. Why? I don't steal from the IRS. Right. Like, you don't know what they can do to you. you know? So, uh, yeah, I definitely think that that's a cool thing. So it's a good question. Yes, yes. Um, from the Mad Elf, uh, what traits make villains relatable? How can you generate sympathy for players for your villain? I think we kind of discussed this in, in the, in the uh, warmonger kind of discussion part that we went through. Yeah. It's, it has a lot to do with – Making them relatable, just that, like giving them a, more than just stats or more than just things they've done. Go with who they are, why they're doing it. Give them drive that makes sense, that is very personal. I mean if someone started mm -hmm. out life as a poor street kid who made their way into a college and then the college ruined them because they were too cheap. You know, They were the Harry Potter kid. Yeah. Harry could have gone a lot of different ways in he that story. He could have. And I'm not saying that his dad was a great role model either by some of the shenanigans he pulled mm -hmm. and straight up bulliness. So you can always look at those kind of characters and, and watch their development, but you have to do the same thing with your villain mm -hmm. and making that villain understandable of why he is or why she is or why they are the way they are makes it that much more relatable that when you get to that point where the players look at them with the you know the the sweaty sword in their hands at their neck and they're questioning whether or not they can really kill them because they've been through the same thing that's when you know you have them mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely I, I think I think my personal technique is take a take a problem mm -hmm. and work through your steps on how you would solve the problem. And then imagine what lines you would cross if consequences weren't a thing. Right. My – because then what you have is you have, OK, so this person was trying to solve this problem. OK, I can see that. And they did this. Right. And they did this. OK, I'm following. And they did this. Yes, absolutely. And then they did this. Wait, what? Right. And it's – and that's – and then you, you go you go one line past what is actually acceptable right. to resolve that issue. Like, you know, uh his his wife died. Okay. He wanted her back. Okay, I can see that. He missed his wife, he wanted her back. So he learned all he could about life and death. Okay. He got some books. Okay. He joined the Wizard Academy. Okay. And then he raised a freaking undead army. Because he wanted to master life and death and resurrect his de his de his long dead wife. Right. Oh oh oh. And then he used that army as a shield. Okay. While he did his final research. Right. And then, right. And then when people came to stop him because he was delving into into these into these right. secrets, he had to kill some people to defend himself, to stop them from discovering what he was doing, or stop them from stopping him from getting right. his wife back. Right. You know. They, or because they didn't understand. The greatness of what he was doing. Right. They didn't understand how, how powerful his love was for her. Right. Your you Dracula know? kind of thing as yeah, well. Yeah, like, absolutely. Again, you know, look at those kinds of relatable villains where if you know everything, it's really hard to hate them. Mm -hmm. But when you don't and it takes time to learn those things, that's when you slowly come to terms with what kind of drive and what kind of passion you're dealing with. Give them those relatable passions. Absolutely. Good Absolutely. question. Good question. Great question. Uh, all right. So what's next here? I think it's another uh, one from it's, him. It's another one from the Mad Elf. Oh, um, boy. How do you manage or balance the villain's hench beings so that they challenge the players but not insurmountable? Uh, so 7C does this particularly well. It does. I'll let you go on this one. OK. So uh, once again, I'm I'm primarily right now a D&D &D 5th edition player. Mm -hmm. um, so in my game – I'm going to lean right back on Kobold Fight Club. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because it, it, it balances your encounters for you. 
Uh, I like to aim for hard as a difficulty. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll rate a medium, hard, deadly, mm-hmm. uh, and easy too. But I don't figure wasting your time with easy encounters, honestly. Um, There's something to be said for them for a scene, but I don't think it's I, – I think those kind of things. In 7th C and what he's talking about is mm-hmm. that there are basically three classes of NPC as far as difficulty. Yep. You have brutes, you have henchmen, and you have villains. Mm-hmm. And brutes are just that. They are cannon fodder. There can be, you know, thinking of scenes from like Man in the Iron Mask or the Three Musketeers where there are hundreds of guards being strewn at them, you know, whether they're, you know, the Count's guards or, you know, the the King's guards or the Musketeers. There's always tons and tons of them and it usually takes one or two simple hits to drop them. But there are so many of them. The uh, the, the the ten or so of Count Rugen's men that Inigo dispatches with a single stab of his sword. Exactly. Yeah. Or a slice or a hit. And that's where you've got – where you're drawing that line between I, I'm not really killing these guys. I am literally just maiming them and putting them out of the way mm-hmm. in some way and then I'm stepping my way to that henchman who is just under the villain. You know, your your Count Richelieu, your your uh, um, your your er, sorry the the Rorschach to the Richelieu, your your uh, secondary villain, your antagonist mm-hmm. who work for them, who is there to slow delay or sometimes enact the plans of the yep. of the villain, and those people are going to be challenging and slippery and. And are going to be those people who are going to try and stop you and slow you at any chance they can or redirect you so that the villain can get their job done. And Mm -hmm. that's really where that slippery, dangerous, constantly throwing bad things at you kind of a person is going to be. Um, So I think that's kind of where you need to balance it is as a storyteller, you have to remember that there's always going to be rabble. There's always going to be rabble that are being organized by someone that's going to be more slippery. Mm -hmm. But when that guy gets his comeuppance – you know that the steps between him and the primary villain or or that group, you know, whether it's a team of 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 henchmen that are put out there, I think would classify whether or not, you know, how big your group is, how far that is from the villain. You're getting close right, to the right. end of the story at that point. So that's how I would take it. Um and that's kind of the description I can give from a seventh C angle as well. I think uh, the other the other thing that comes to mind too is that um, typically when you're dealing with villains and with with henchmen and such like that, you are still dealing with uh, humanoids right. in some sort of way. You're dealing with sentient creatures always, and sentient creatures are typically mortal. Mm-hmm. They typically fear death. Yes, and so uh, a great way to make them a challenge but not insurmountable is to give them retreat conditions. Yes, uh, so you may throw ten bandits. At your at your group in an ambush, but if they write something in the margins that says if they dispatch the leader mm-hmm. or if they dispatch more than three of those bandits, then they will they will call the retreat. Yep. Um, and it's really up to the group at that point as to whether or not they want to let them get away. But you turn it, you turn the the the, the balance of it. Now, yeah. You know? I mean, fifth element, uh, Eggnock was one of the was the main dude who was leading all of those. Uh, the 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 mercenary forces. Yep. The yep. moment that the leader guy takes a bullet to the head, they're all like, "Oh shoot!" Yep. You know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they got nothing, and that's the kind of thing you need to have. You need to know when when those guys are going to stop. Uh, man in the iron mask. Mm-hmm. You've got the the primary uh uh antagonist who's working is literally working against them up until the very last moment where his catch point. Is seeing the man he admires nearly dying. Mm-hmm. And he's like, all I wanted to be was him. So I'm no longer working for you, jackass. Right. You know? Right. And that's that's how mm-hmm. we take those moments, is you have to know that condition. Yep. yep. So or even even just, you know, the, the the guy designated as the leader is the strongest of us. Exactly. And so if they can beat the strongest, you know, if someone goes up and one punches Dwayne the Rock Johnson, <laughs> are you gonna step up? Probably not. No. Probably not. No. Plus, it's Dwayne. Come on. It's it's come on. You know, you can smell what he's cooking. Yeah. Yeah. All right. One more. All right. And this one comes at us from Knox in the Box, and this is the one that uh that that just floored us, I think. Uh do you think that labeling a character a villain before even writing them would hinder the scope or potential that character could have? We brought this up. Yes. And and 
I now that we've come to kind of the close, we can here we can bit, we can give it its due attention now. I would say yeah. I don't think it does. I think it only hinders you in the sense that your mind is on a path for who this person is. I think if you understand that the word villain means I'm willing to push boundaries that others won't mm-hmm. to get to my goal, then no. I think you're 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 just setting a status. You're you're defining who the the level that 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 individual is willing to take. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, you're because because you can you can always you can always move from villain. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it, that's not a static point. It's a starting point, but it's not a static point. Um, I I have two thoughts on this. Okay. Uh, my first being that um, I don't think this is as big of a problem. In a tabletop role playing game, mm-hmm. as it is, say, like in real life, like mm-hmm. if I label someone as a villain, mm-hmm. yes, I, I, in my own mind, am not allowing them any latitude to be anything else. You right. Know? I think that's that's a that's a from from a sociological standpoint, you're you're absolutely correct. Uh, when you're writing a story, though, you need to lean into certain tropes mm-hmm. and, um. You need heroes. You need villains. Villains are just, you know, uh, 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 de, uh, Damon as Deus in versus the de, uh, the devil is God's shadow. Okay. Um. What can can you have light, but for primeval darkness? Okay. Um. You need it. You need that contrast point to be able to tell. I mean, all good stories need conflict. From conflict, you 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 get your villainy and such like that. And so somebody has to be the bad guy. I would agree. I mean, I think there are definitely storyscapes that are not at that campaign level, like mm-hmm. Shadowrun, where it's very episodic, where you're not necessarily going to have a villain. And by labeling a villain, you're labeling it for the moment. Sure. Really, it's more of an antagonist. Mm-hmm. And I think you can get stuck around the term villain a little yeah. bit in those cases. But I think when you're really – when you're developing a campaign mm-hmm. or you're developing something larger, a a more than one – or two, uh, you know, game session mm-hmm. kind of story. I think it doesn't hurt you. I think it gives you that that advantage a little bit of knowing where you're going to go with this particular individual. Absolutely, absolutely. And the the other the other the other thought was basically just that. Um, yeah, you can you can always you can always move. Yeah, you can always move from villain. Um, villains on a permanent position. You know, Zuko was a villain. Right, exactly, and I, and he was he was the he was a, he was a hero by the end of the series. Right. Um, so and to just be prepared to do to move from that, mm-hmm. be prepared to let the, either the setting help you with that, or maybe there's another one that's already come up in your story. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So next week's topic uh, is one that I've been interested in trying to do, uh, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun with, and that is tools of the trade. And gaming in the digital era, what what kind of things have we added? And I know the question has come up within the group. I know we've talked about it a lot. We've got lots of tools that we've gone through over the the years of doing it. Yeah, and absolutely. And I, I think we're going to bring in a guest as We well. are going to have a very special guest, a very yes. special guest to myself because yes. it's my boyfriend. Yes, <laughs> uh, who definitely dabbles in technology like I do but has gone – I think an extra mile in a couple of cases. So we're gonna we're gonna try and have some fun with next uh, session a little bit, and Kate may may be helping us a little bit on that, uh, and we'll see where things go. It's your moment to shine, Kate. That's right. It's that's your right. moment to shine. The joys of the engineer in the room. Uh, so for with that being said, remember you can always find us on Twitter at st underscore conclave and Instagram when we post up there uh, st underscore conclave. Uh, but always go ahead and look at that link that we've got pinned in Twitter to find our Discord and join, interact, ask questions, give us some topics for the show so that we can continue making content for you, the listener. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and uh, we also want to give a uh, special shout out to our uh, people who made our intro music. This is Beyond the Warriors by Gooey Frog. And our outro music, Only Our Footprints in the Sand by Midair Machine. You can find both those tracks and so much more at freemusicarchive.org. Remember, this all is happening because of Podcast Detroit. You can find them at podcastdetroit.com. Uh, or on Twitter at Podcast Detroit. We'd also like to specially thank our engineer, Kay. She is so wonderful. We have so much fun with her, too. As well as our families, Vicky and Sean, and all of our friends who make our games so worthwhile. And you, our listeners, for listening in. Thank you so much. We love you, and we'll see you next week.